Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, adventurers, travelers, investors, entrepreneurs, and simply mind bogglers. To find all episodes of this show, simply go to Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, or go to our website, judgmentcallpodcast.com. If you like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the airfare deals that you really want. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% in the airfare. Those include $150 round-trip tickets to Hawaii for many cities in the US, or $600 life led tickets in business class from the US to Asia, or $100 business class life led tickets from Africa round trip all the way to Asia. In case you didn't know, about half the world is open for business again and accepts travelers. Most of those countries are in South America, Africa and Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP or if that's too many letters for you, simply go to MTP, the number four, and the letter u.com to sign up for your 30 day free trial. Jeff, welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. Thanks for Thank you very us. much. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah, uh, you know, we've been going back and forth quite some time. I really wanted to have you on the show. You are a professor who has currently the chair in entrepreneurship at the Belmont University in Nashville, but you weren't just an entrepreneur in theory in academia, you also went to the dark side. You <laughs> went and started and helped build another business and then you went back into academia. Maybe you can help us understand a little more what is your motivation? Why is entrepreneurship so dear to your heart? And how did that work that you went from academia to business and back? Yeah, sure. So um, for me, it, it started back uh, when I was a, a kid. My dad, um, was a was a corporate person, but had a real fascination with small business. Uh, we didn't use the word entrepreneurship. This is back in the '60s and '70s. It was it was small business. It was privately owned businesses, and he was very interested in that. He did a lot of what we would call today angel investing, um, but it was it was more on the scale of smaller. Kind of local little businesses. He wasn't looking for the kind of returns that a lot of angels look for today. Um, but it was a, it was the environment that I grew up in, and so I I kind of uh, I didn't have a whole lot of choice but to be exposed to this. Um, I have three brothers. I'm I'm the only one who really um, was fascinated by this and 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 really was drawn to it. And so uh, he took a hold of that and, and gave me lots of opportunities at a young age to uh, be pretty involved in, in lots of these business decisions and, and, and work in these companies in, in meaningful ways. And it, it just lit a fire in me that's, that's never gone away. Um, I went to college and uh, in, in the 70s, um, if you had an interest in small business or entrepreneurship, the professors would tell you that you're wasting your time in college. And that's exactly what they told me. They said, you know, we can't teach you anything here. We're preparing people for corporate America. And, uh, and I, I really enjoyed college though. So I decided I would stay. So I finished up college and um, was looking to, to go back and do some work in some family holdings, but I really enjoyed school. And so um, took a break from the family business and went back and got my MBA. Um, Wanted to get it in finance because I thought that would be a good complementary skill for the kind of stuff I was doing uh, with my own businesses and with some of the stuff I was helping my dad with. And and I, I just, to this day, I, I don't think you can get enough financial literacy in, in terms of being an entrepreneur. So I did that, um, came out with an MBA in 1980, and the economy was in absolute shambles. Uh, there was... There was no, no jobs to be had. Um, uh, a couple of the businesses that my dad had, um, he uh, 
one was was shut down, one failed. Um, and so uh, I was kind of trying to figure out what to do. Uh, couldn't get a job on my own because there weren't any. Um, an MBA in finance was pretty meaningless in 1980 because interest rates were a mortgage was about 16, 17, 18 percent. And, and they were laying off people with MBAs and, and 20 years experience. And so finally, the only interview uh, I got um, was with a little college in Missouri. And, and they wanted me to come and teach finance for a year. I was married. We were uh, on our way to have our, uh, a family. And so I needed a job. So uh, I thought I would pursue that. And, and the University of Kentucky, where I was doing my, my MBA, when I went to get my, my letter of recommendation from the associate dean, he said, well, I didn't know you had an interest in academia. And I said, me neither, but I got to pay the bills. And so he said, well, why don't you stick around here? We can, we'll work something out financially for you and, and we can have you teach a little bit as well. And why don't you start working on a doctorate and, and see how it goes. So we decided to stay there. My wife had a, had a, had a decent job. It wasn't anything spectacular, but it was a good paying job. And, and, and so we decided to stay there. Got my doctorate, um, finished it up in three years, which is pretty quick. Um, and uh, um, decided to try teaching for a little bit to see if I liked it. Um, loved teaching, but hated what I was forced to teach during that time. Um, there was starting to be a little bit of entrepreneurship in academia. Uh, but not much. Uh, I was teaching uh, corporate strategy and principles of management. Uh, when I tell that to my students, they all chuckle pretty loud because it's, you know, they know me well and they know that's just not me. Uh, but that yeah, it seems like that the, uh, the whole category of entrepreneurship is a relatively new thing, right? So um, I might not be old enough to remember, but I felt that that's, that, that would be my next question for you. Maybe you, you, you can probably um, answer both. If How do you define entrepreneurship and how did it come to be a separate category of business studies? Well, it was, it was starting about the time when I was first teaching in the 80s, but it was, a, it was an outlier. And, and part of the challenge that we had was defining what it was and where it belonged and what the boundaries were. Um, Colleges that had it in the 80s would usually put it in a management department, which always struck me as kind of odd because most of that is large corporate structural kinds of things that you study and, and work on. Uh, a few put it in departments of marketing. It, it, we were kind of an orphan uh, discipline. Um, the definition of entrepreneurship is something that um, I have been debating with people uh, probably for a good 30, 40 years now. And I, we still don't have, I don't think, a definite answer. Um, it, it's, it's more around boundaries and what it describes. One of the issues is, does it describe a person or a process? Um, I tend to fall on the side of the process. I, I think there are people who are drawn to be an entrepreneur, but what I can teach them from the discipline is a process. And so that's where I put most of my focus. There's also a lot of discussion around boundaries. You know, what, what falls within entrepreneurship? Um, if I buy an existing business, is that entrepreneurship? If, if I buy a franchise, is that entrepreneurship? If I take over a family business, is that entrepreneurship? Or is it just the act of starting a business? And if it is the act of starting a business, when do you stop being an entrepreneur and start becoming a manager? And, and these... These sound like academic questions, but they're important because they help us understanding how to not only teach people, but also how to serve as a good coach and a good mentor. And, and in many ways, I think that's the more important part of my professional life has been uh, the work I do mentoring and coaching people individually, as opposed to the, some, some of the things that I can do from the classroom. Uh, for me personally, what I think entrepreneurship um, if I have to get down to one aspect that, that defines it for me, it's, it's risk. Uh, are you financially and personally at risk in what you're doing? 
So if you buy a business or you own the business, you sign the guarantees and the bank loans. To me, you're an entrepreneur because you are, t- you are taking risk and you privately own that business. People disagree with me on that. And, and even people I've done some work with have a, have a different approach to that. So there is no one answer that we've come to even today. Uh, I, have, I have a dear friend who, who I've done a lot of work with over the years. Uh, he's much more focused on the act of high growth, high potential ventures. And so that's kind of his narrow definitional window. The interesting thing is, though, if we can strip all that away, the products are about the same. There's a set of processes that are common to uh, getting a business off the ground. There are a set of processes that are common to an early stage business. And there are a set of uh, processes that are common to a growing company. And so these are all things that we can we can identify, we can we can learn about, and we can teach, and we can coach people on how to do these things better. Yeah, I really feel that Nassim Taleb worded it best when he came up with the skin in the game, right? right. Which is a Wall Street saying. Yep. And it's this personal risk, and you definitely have to put money at risk and your reputation, and maybe both at the same time. And we feel when we say the word entrepreneur, we, we, we have that in the back of our minds, most people have the hustle or the Silicon Valley entrepreneur, the Silicon Valley entrepreneur who is usually not putting his own money at risk. A lot of people don't know that. Definitely your reputation, but ne- not necessarily your money. It's a small amount of money. In most cases, right. well, every startup is slightly different. And I feel this, this theme that we have the ability to to distribute risk through society by individual risk takers. So we, 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 I think of it in that, in that manner that like the Greek said, right? We have this hero who goes out. It doesn't have to be male, female and male, both is good, but it's someone in society and it's a good part of society who goes out, finds the dragon, wrestles with the dragon, comes back and tells us, okay, the dragon isn't actually that scary, right? So find something new, takes a calculated risk and, with this discovery, discovery and by staking their own reputation and their own monetary success to it, meaning that's the gold that you bring back from the dragon, right? You help society understand, and now, especially nowadays with the internet, we all can adopt that certain solution that that person found or that team found doesn't have to be the single entrepreneur. And I feel this distributed risk-taking in society hasn't really gotten the the attribution it should have gotten. There was this wave in the 90s, but since then I feel it in popular culture it doesn't really appear. Either it's a billionaire, or most of billionaires don't really take a lot of risks anymore because they have a billion in, in a Swiss bank and they have no downside really in their, in their personal life, right? right? They might feel like they have it and they have some anxiety, but really they, is, they won't be poor ever again. And that's fine. And what we need is the family entrepreneur. It's kind of almost like a like a Chinese expat model where Chinese who emigrated from, from China mainland set up these little risk-taking business and stake their life to it. I feel this is my idea of the entrepreneur. And America used to be the country that had this as its heart, who, which was always a country where everyone was, their hobby was risk-taking entrepreneurship business, right? That that's, I, this entrepreneur is a French word, so it was business, right? What, what business deal are we involved in? Is there a right. fun business for me to do? And somehow, at least in popular culture, we've lost this theme completely. We have the billionaires, and then we have our Karl Marxian struggle about socialism. But what we actually need, and I think Nassim Taleb really put his finger on in his last book, is we need those risk takers because we all, it's, it's a little risk for the person, but it's a huge payoff for society potentially. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think it's, it's a benefit to society in a cumulative manner. You know, as, as someone, I've, I've, I've started a business uh, with my daughter and son a few years ago. And it's a, it, right now it's a side hustle for all three of us because we all have day jobs. Um, and and I you know it's it's in the educational space. I don't think we're going to reinvent education, but I think I think we're going to make a contribution in some of the things that we're doing that are innovative, and and when brought together with a thousand other people trying to attack this problem space we have now in education, I think that's the cumulative effect, and that's how entrepreneurs work. I I think one of the 
one of the things that can be really um, uh, can hurt our perception of entrepreneurship as as a society is 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 this fixation on those um, huge mega successes. Much of that is luck, uh, and 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 much of that has gotten, as you said earlier, has gotten completely removed from risk taking. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos has no risk in his life financially, never will, and and. And he's he's gotten so far removed from risk taking that it, it it's really it's something different to me than than that early stage um, entrepreneur that sees a problem in the market and says, I'm going to go fix that problem because people are going to pay me money to fix that problem. And and it's that cumulative effect of, of millions of people doing that that has a big impact. I, I'm. I'm a little pessimistic right now, which is unusual for me. I'm usually the I'm usually a very optimistic person, but but I'm concerned that that some of that entrepreneurial fire in our culture uh, has has been somewhat dampened. Um, I think it's dampened uh, for for a number of reasons that we could spend hours and hours talking about, um, but no matter what we think the cause is, it has been dampened. And, and I worry, as I'm seeing kids come into college today, that I don't see that fire in the belly that I used to see. I don't see that, that burning desire. They get up and they can't wait to try and do this. And, and, and they try to get these things started before they graduate because they're just so excited and so eager. Um, it, it's, it's becoming less and less common for me to see people with that kind of burning desire. Now there are some, and I have some really good ones and some, and some good businesses being started, but uh, it, the intensity is not there like it used to be. And, and the attraction to risk taking is not there. When, when we talk, we saw a remarkable thing. The millennials had us all convinced that they were gonna be the entrepreneurial generation. In fact, people were calling them that. 67% of them described themselves as entrepreneurial. Over 50% of them said that the primary reason they went to college is that they wanted to own their own business someday. And yet, now that they're out in the workforce and we look at their startup rate, their startup rate at this point in life compared to Gen X at the same point in life is about half. So Gen X, who we, <laughs> we kind of made fun of as, as sort of this non-entrepreneurial generation, we're twice as likely to have their own business coming out of college than the millennials. So the millennials talked a really good game, but when they discovered the risk-taking that's involved with being an entrepreneur, they balked. Um, yeah. They were afraid of failure. One of the things that we discovered is, is they're, they're scared to death of failure. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's part of the game. I mean, it's just, you are gonna fail. If you do this long enough, you're gonna fail. It's just like- I wonder, I wonder where this, where this change of mind came from. And you have written about almost a dozen books on entrepreneurship, so you're the foremost experts. How I, love. I really love that we, we have this discussion today. Is that a pressure that was exerted on this generation? And I, I make this claim that there is a much smaller window of opportunity available now, big opportunities. There's tons of platform opportunities, I call them. You can work for Uber, the whole gig economy. Yeah. There is social media. There's a lot of YouTube entrepreneurs. There's tons and tons of Instagram entrepreneurs. So these people exist, but they're driven by platforms and you don't really have much control. The platform changes the algorithm and then all the work from the last couple of years is gone or your account that gets deleted. That happens quite a bit. What are they... Are they not able to, to see the big picture or is the big picture, because we keep alive these big zombie companies, we have 0% interest rates and we have all these old companies who should have gone away 20 years ago. We keep, we, we, we keep meddling with this way the economy works so that United can still fly. Or American has 100 billion and another 100 billion in, in loans, which they probably don't need. We could just create another company more entrepreneurial and they would do the same thing for a tenth of that money. So we kind of act like, and we said interest rate artificially, we act like we're kind of the Soviet Union suddenly. Now we don't have the Soviet Union anymore as so an antithesis. So we, we feel like we need to be a bit like, and we can't cheat the market, but this is to the downside that the millennials discovered. If you cheat the market, you're in trouble. 
You know, I I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, but I don't think it's as new as sometimes we think it is. Um, there's been government corporate alliances that have gone back to World War II in this country. And, and, and there's been... Um, there, there's been absolute rent-seeking kinds of relationships between large corporations and government going back to even earlier in the 1900s and World War II. Um, so I don't think that that has changed. I think I think you're right. I think it's become it's accelerated and and it's it's certainly more transparent now. Uh, but that's always been there. And we entrepreneurs, one of my business partners. Um, we were we were entrepreneurs in the healthcare industry. When I when I left academics, I, I taught for five years, and I realized I needed to get out of there because I didn't want to teach corporate strategy for the rest of my life, and I, I was itching to to go out and, and start a business again, and, and coll uh, colluded with these guys who are uh, who are trying to deal with uh, the the healthcare industry back when managed care first came into the eighties, and I was. It was an exciting time because the whole industry was being disrupted. And I love the metaphor that one of my partners always used to say. He said, you know, there's all these giant healthcare companies that are, or, and, and, and not just companies, but bodies like the medical profession and the hospital industry that have all of this favor given to them by the government. And yet as entrepreneurs, we're able to navigate and make things happen and cause disruption and change. And he always talked about us, you know, we're like the mammals that are, are dancing uh, under the, you know, trying to scurry around under the feet of these dinosaurs. And, and he said, you know, we're the future. We're what's going to evolve into the next thing. The dinosaurs don't realize that. They could squash us if they even understood it, but they don't even understand it and don't care. And, and so I think there's a certain amount of that that's always been around. To, to me, what's going on with, with the millennials, and, and I'm, I'm fearing also with Gen Z, is much more a cultural thing. I think it's much more of, of um, there's a complacency that, that's arisen culturally. And, and, and we have a, an incredibly overprotective generation of parents. And when I say that to my students, I'm afraid I'm going to offend them. And they all laugh and nod their heads because they, you know, the, the vast majority of them can, can identify situations in their life when their parents got them out of a situation. Um, and, and for many, it's been multiple, multiple situations. You know, they'll, they'll call professors, they'll call the university, they'll call the provost, they'll call the president if they don't like something that's going on. Um, but that must have been the case a long time ago. So this, this pressure for the parents to do the best for their children. I mean, that's inbuilt. We had this for millions of yeah, years. But, but now it seems to reach this level that it actually makes a difference. No, it's... Why it, is that it, the last it, 20, no, 20 it's, years? It, it, you're right that it's been around forever, but it's, it's manifest itself in a completely different way today. I agree, I agree. Um, my parents, who grew up in the Depression, they believed the best way to, to prepare me for the world and to do the best for me was to let me fall and, you know, skin my knee and, and fail and, and learn from these things. And, you know, and, and, and if I didn't make a sports team, that's good for me. I learned what I can do and what I can't do. And maybe I need to work a little harder next time. And it, it, you know, they, they, they did everything they could to provide intrinsic motivation that doing the best for kids now is doing everything for those kids, parents, routinely write essays for college entrance for their kids. Parents routinely help their students, uh, their, their children with projects, even in college. Uh, we had one recently where, where the, the, one of our students' um, father's executives at his company basically did his assignment for him. And, and, and we caught it because it was obviously not done by the student. We finally figured it out. And, and the student and the parent didn't understand what was wrong because the goal was to get, to get, you know, get this student to where they needed to get them at all, the, at all costs, not teach the student how to get there him or herself, not teach them and give them the skills so that they can go out and have confidence being a scrappy entrepreneur.
I fully agree with you, but I feel like this this is something that was intrinsic to this coddling of the American mind. It's something that I felt always parents were carrying with them. Now they do, and I, I fully agree with you. It's gone to extremes. But I, I feel like there was a there was a pressure from the other side. There was something that, that this would be described now didn't happen 2,000 years ago. We can say, well, because we have more money now, we have more comfort. And yes, this all makes sense. But I feel like there was a force to this, this move the equilibrium before and now we, we, we see this coddling of, of children and on a mass environment and obviously it's a competitive game right so one parent writes an essay and the other parent realizes and says oh yeah i should have helped because you know my friends helped so i should do this too i think it's it spreads through society as this competitive pressure and maybe because is it because we've a lot of boomer generation they are being ascribed to to see to see their own children fail and then on the other hand, we say, well, they fail because of the society that you created that does, doesn't create enough opportunities for you. And then they make up for that shortcoming and helping them from coddling them. And, you know, you can still live in the basement for the next 30 years. We always give you $1,000 a month as a stipend. Is that their fault? Can we, can we blame it on them? It sounds kind of silly because they don't know, right? They, nobody individually knows. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know blaming them is the right word, but, but I think we can attribute causation. Yeah. Um, and it's and, a better word for blame. I agree. Yeah. I Much mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're doing it in a malicious way. I don't, I, I think they really genuinely believe they're doing the best for their child. Yeah. But you're not, I mean, you're not doing the best for your child when, when it, so risk. Okay. We, we talked about this earlier. Risk is at the essence of entrepreneurship. Let's get back to that for a minute. Yeah. Risk has two dimensions to it. Risk has the downside risk, the risk of failure, and risk also has the upside risk. That's the risk of missed opportunities. And so as the entrepreneur, we're constantly, that, that's been my whole life, uh, has been this struggle between, okay, is this going to fail? Oh, but on the other hand, I don't want to miss that opportunity. And so there's this, there's this tension between the two types of risk, upside and downside, that the entrepreneur lives within. Those things have been removed from these kids. They don't, they don't, they're not motivated by the upside because everything is taken care, of, care for, you know, taking care of them for them. They drive better cars than I drive. They drive better cars than their parents drive sometimes. Yeah. And, and so uh, there, there's, there's, there's no hunger for the upside. And... And, and there is, there's no experience with the downside. So they're afraid of it. You know, you talk about the dragon. Um, and the entrepreneur goes out and says, okay, this dragon, I slayed it. It's not as bad as you thought. Here it is. Um, they're petrified of the dragons. Yeah. They're petrified of failure. They're, they're petrified. I, 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 I am shocked at the number of young entrepreneurs. And, and again, I am optimistic. I love what I do and I have some amazing success stories. So I don't want, you know, I don't want to get the impression that it's all a bunch of failure. It's just gotten a lot harder for me to do what I do. Uh, be, You're because, not the only one who makes that observation, you know, yeah. that, that idea of, 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 retreating from risk taking it's it's i think it's the, the secret is out a lot of people see it um we all maybe have slightly different words for it but it's something that has been going on definitely since the 90s now we can say well the 90s they were an exaggeration and they were crazy and they were right so the, the end of the 90s definitely but it gave rise to a set of companies who could change the world and i always always like what venture capitalists say they, they look at this sector and say, I want to have exposure to the sector. And for the longest time, I didn't really understand what they meant by this. And they said, well, I just want to put some money at risk because I think this sector is going to bubble up. If this company will bubble up, I have no idea in the end. But I know right. that something good might happen in this sector. This is my prediction, and I'm ready to put my money at it. It's obviously not their money. It's other people's right. money. But it's another problem of, of, of the, the agency problem there. Because we have an agent who is risking a lot of money that isn't theirs. They never risk their own money. It's like their funds expenditures are usually paid by the investment studio. So as more investments to make, as more money to make. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is quite a, a strange game when people really look behind the curtain and see what goes on in the venture-backed world. You're absolutely yeah. right. The people investing the money, it's not really their money. It's, it's institutional money. 
And then, as you said earlier, the entrepreneur really doesn't have a lot of financial risk because the money is coming from this institutional investor that's putting the money through this venture capitalist. And, and, and the, way the, 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 the way the game is played, they only need 10% of their deals to work to get the returns that these investors want. And so they're pumping a bunch of jet fuel into a lot of deals and, and, and couldn't care less if they fail or succeed. Um, but that, that whole world is, is less than 1% of the world of entrepreneurship. It, it, it's, 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 it, when, when students come into class for the first time and start quoting Shark Tank, I, I, I tell them, you know, first of all, Shark Tank isn't real. Second of all, if it was real, you need to understand it represents less than 1% of the world that you're going to live in as an entrepreneur. And, and by the way, I've never watched Shark Tank because the last thing in the world I want to do is watch something that's not real when I'm dealing with the reality of that all day. And it's the last thing I want to see. And, but that to them is what entrepreneurship is. And, and it, it's not, you know, you, I, I think we've, you know, I used to complain that we didn't look to our entrepreneurs as heroes. I, I, and that, that bothered me in the 80s and 90s. I thought we were, uh, we were, we were celebrating a lot of people in our culture and, and none of them were entrepreneurs. And now it's as if we've almost gone to the other extreme. And, and, the, and now our biggest rock stars are, are these entrepreneurs that have gotten, many of them have gotten very lucky and, and been that 1% that's, that succeeded. And we say, oh, well, that person has a magic formula. No, there were 99 other really smart people that had really interesting solutions. This is just the one that worked. It's the lucky one. You know, you go back, Go back to the to the 1980s, and we were we were seeing the the, the we were seeing the evolution from the mainframe computer to dis, what we used to call distributed computing, which ended up being desktops and laptops and so forth. And and there were thousands and thousands of experiments going on. It wasn't Steve Jobs and 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 Bill Gates, you know, that they they figured it out and that was the end of the story. There were thousands of other people, and many of whom we thought were going to be the winners. Um, yeah, but I think I think Apple is a is an excellent example because what 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 it illustrates is I think what the millennials have actually figured out, and it is that the world of entrepreneurship is more resembling Hollywood than ever before. It's becoming yeah. a show business. Yeah. So there's plenty yeah. of solutions. Everyone has, it's, the solution is actually a commodity. Everyone in China does the same thing for you, and you order the same box, right? But there will be only one or two companies who in the end stand around and are the winners of this game. Most of these new businesses are winner takes it all businesses, um, like software especially. And right. when you look at software startups, I was just <laughs> talking to Steven, and he told me, he, and he, it was like a side note, but for me it's still mesmerizing that 80 to 90 percent of all the investment that goes into software startups where you think on all technology startups is actually customer acquisition so all the money goes to sales guys there is two people who develop software or hardware or whatever but all the back end is in china so all the factories are, are offshore and literally you raise 100 million but you throw 90 million into sales and this sales as you know it's it won't make any money for the next five years you just do it to bring the numbers up to, to get the next round and I, you can say, oh, this is just for the weird VC businesses, but it's true for, for anything that is related to in technology, customer acquisition is everything. So sales is the most important thing. And in turn, showmanship and in developing sales channels, often through social media, is what makes or breaks a business these days. And I think the millennials have figured this out. They, they don't care about the back end. They don't want to do any software. They don't want to take any risk. They just want to show up with a lot of likes on social media, which in turn can make or break a business. Yeah, I, I guess I would argue that. I guess I would argue that sales has always been the driver, though. I mean, if 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 I look back uh, at my my dad's career in in manufacturing, I mean, he was very old school business. He he ran a company that manufactured washing machines and drying, you know, washers and dryers, and 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 I think of all the lessons that he taught me, and and. And probably eighty to ninety percent of them related to sales. 
and yeah. and the importance of hustle and and in selling and 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 when I th- when I think about all the mentors that I've worked with and 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 worked alongside of, one of our biggest collective complaints is that a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand how important sales is. They think I'm going to invent this really cool thing, and of course the whole world's going to see it, and and of course the whole world's going to come and and beat a path to my door. Um, because that's what I've seen on television. And, and it's just not true. It's hard work, it's hustle, it's selling, it's a lot of mistakes. And, and, and early on, the entrepreneur has to be doing the selling him or herself. And, and a lot of them don't wanna get their hands dirty that way. And, and so I would argue, not only do they not wanna get their hands dirty with the tech, as you're saying, I agree with that, but a lot of them don't even wanna get their hands dirty with selling, which is critical. And, and so, yeah. Um, you know, that it, it, it's a rough place um, when you're not willing to do the work to get the business built and you're also not willing to sell it. Uh, you know, selling, it, it's interesting. Selling became sort of this, this backwater part of business education um, back in the 1970s. There was, there was this, this period of time when the marketing profession emerged and 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 it was very glossy and it was very sophisticated and and it became a very dominant part of corporate america it became a very dominant part of business education and and sales was considered sort of the the sleazy um dirty kind of underbelly that they really didn't want to talk about i feel it still is and yeah but then you look at the companies who made it they they figured this out, but sales was different. Sales was one was more one to one relationship, especially in business sale. If you had a business product, oh, right, it, and it still is in business to business sales. Still is, still yeah. is. You, you definitely can make that argument. I think it's changing too. But I think what millennials have figured out in all the industries they are involved in and they know for better or worse, they're being commoditized so quickly. And all that's left is who's get the most viral bus. That, if you don't no, have the viral true. bus in your niche, you, you're done. You know, you, you, because that next person has literally no sales costs and has 100% margins and you have zero yeah. margins. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I, I, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people arguing recently that we have compressed the business life cycle you know, down from years to months in some cases. Yeah. And that's that churn you're talking about that goes on. And, 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 and so, um, I, I think I, I see people, you know, not have the kind of patience you need to build a really good company. You know, one of the, one of the things that drew me to entrepreneurship and one of the things that, that made me really love what I've done in my life, um, got back to the, the, the social, the social contribution it has to our economy. It, it creates jobs. And, and without good jobs, you know, none of this is going to matter. Um, you know, we need people with good jobs to have money to spend, and that builds healthy communities and, and so forth and so on. And, and we, you know, there's, been, there, there's been a real disconnect in my mind to sort of that long-term game of, you know, building good companies that build good workforces that create good jobs. Um, there was there was a spark of it about ten or 15, 20 years ago, when everybody was obsessed about building companies with really good cultures and really great places to work. And yeah. I'm not hearing as much of that anymore now. Uh, oh, no. there, yeah, there, you, yeah. That's I think this whole idea is gone. There's still some leftovers in Silicon Valley, but I feel like the 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 dream of most entrepreneurs now is this like a drop shipping business. Like you literally, yeah. you have other people involved as freelancers yeah. and you make $10 million in revenue and you may take home $5 million. I think this is the goal of most entrepreneurs and this is where the entrepreneurial energy is. And to an extent, I must say this isn't a bad thing because we have this huge specialization going on in our economy, especially in the new fields. Obviously in healthcare, it hasn't happened there yet, but it, you know, it's creeping in through AI and software. So if you take the specialization, will we all end up as an entrepreneur developing one thing and just, you know, letting it grow and being the, the one on the planet who understands it, the only one you can be, I, I attribute for small teams. There's usually a couple hundred freelancers involved in the back end. Um, but is that the role of the, the company in the future and this old school companies will die out? How do you, how do you see this developing? And is there an entrepreneurial gene? Is there, is, 
is there, can there only be, and that's what a lot of people put forward, there's only, say, 1%, 2% of the population who can be an entrepreneur. This is how this is built. They are sociopaths to an, to, to an extent. They overestimate their own abilities. There's a lot of things wrong with the entrepreneurs. Or can we all be entrepreneurs? Um, there's a lot to unpack, and there's sort of like two threads that you just talk about. Um, yeah. let, let, me, let me address the issue of what this is going to look like in the future first. Um, I, I worry about, about, um, and I am, I mean, one of the books I wrote was a bootstrapping. And so I, I believe heavily, you know, in, in the power and the beauty of bootstrapping, but every good thing can be taken to extremes and become bad. And, and I think, I, I think I'm seeing this fragmentation of, of the business model to the point where there is bootstrapping has sort of created this this Frankenstein monster where there's little pieces of it all over the place and it it doesn't really have a soul to it. Um, and if that's the future of business, I think we want we we run a real significant risk because capitalism and free enterprise is under attack and 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 it is under attack culturally and and, and one of the big things that, um, it's being attacked for um, to some degree can be traced to, to, to that whole game of, of high growth, high potential venture backed firms and, and the glamorization of these things and, and uber rich people and, and all of this because it, you know, my dad used to always say, he, he always say, you know, Free enterprise is, is, a, is a delicate experiment. He said, we've really never had a culture that's taken it to the extreme that, that America did. But my, my dad was an interesting guy. He's very much, he's very philosophical about business and he never, he never went to college. He just was a smart guy who observed a lot. And, and, and he did a lot of international business and, and he worried that we didn't understand the fragility of, of the free market. It, it is... You know, it, it, as um, uh, as a, as a lot of really brilliant scholars have pointed out, it, it's it's at its best. Free enterprise is, is a whole series of voluntary exchanges, and 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 if we corrupt that system, um, we're gonna we're gonna that whole system can fall apart, and and so one of the things that I worry about. Is is an obsession with too narrow of a view of of organizational success. Now, I am not anyone who believes in stakeholder capitalism is 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 a good path. Uh, I, I will say honestly, I think that's a very misguided model. But I also know that for us to be able to pr pursue profits and pursue wealth, um, we have to do this with a sense of responsibility. We have to do this with a sense um, of, of understanding that without uh, Adam Smith. All right, let's go back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith, yes, he wrote The Wealth of Nations. Yes, he taught, taught us about the invisible hand. Yes, he taught us about the free market first time. But he also was very well known for his his theological philosophy. And, and, and he wrote a companion book to the Wealth of Nations in which he said, listen, all this that I talk about Wealth of Nations won't work if we don't have good people you know, who, have, who, have, who care about society, who care about the people who work for them, who care about the people who invest in them. And, and all of those things are delicate free exchanges that if we abuse those, will fall apart. So yeah. if, if, we end up in a, if we end up with a culture in which... Um, uh, we take this 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 fragmentation of of the business model to extremes. Uh, I, I'm I'm worried there's no there's nothing solid there for us to to build a society to culture upon, and, and you can't separate economics from culture and and society. Where uh, to have a healthy culture and a healthy society, you need a strong economy, and and, and in my opinion, you need a free economy. Now, getting back to your question about the... But, but we can rephrase this as a challenge, right? Um, I don't want to interrupt you, but... No, that's all right. It's, it's definitely a, a point where we feel 
something is changing. There is definitely this. We, we've lost the, the, the undergrowth of, of theology. We are not all yeah. Christians anymore. And if, yeah. even if we are, we, we think Christianity is something for Sunday mornings and that's it. It doesn't really guide our, our principles much anymore. Correct. Now, this is different from city to city, region to region in the U.S., but that's been a trend for the longest time in Europe and the U.S. now too, or anywhere in the world. Yeah. Some countries go slightly different way. And I think it's a challenge that we have to live with this slightly changed value system. And I, what I kind of argue for is that there is a lot of utility, and you just pointed it out, for this, you know, the, this, a certain constants of the of culture that mostly come, we, we take them out of Christianity, but, you know, they come out of other, from, from Islam, they come from, from different books, but we can all trace them to certain ideas that are actually very, very similar. Yep. And there isn't, I'd say that the list is not very long. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100 certain ways you should behave. Confucius actually only had proverbs, right? So, so most of these things are exactly what you can abstract out of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even the Quran. They're very, very similar. If we could figure out this utility in these things and not do this game where we, we, we push each other, we push each other's buttons, you're an atheist, you're, you're, you're crazy, um, theologists, you, you crazy religious, if we consider this utility, and I think to an extent we already have that in the in these institutions that we have, if we re, re-enable these institutions that change society, but knowing the utility of religion, I think this is a wonderful challenge because what, what happens is this whole model that we've been giving the world, right, democracy, freedom, free trade, what we've been advertising forever, we can adopt it to more and more places in the world. It becomes more exportable. The, the U.S. way of life becomes more exportable because there is certain things that are intrinsically Christian that you just can't export to an Islamic country right now. We right. see that in the United Arab Emirates. We see that's right. the most American country in the Middle East. And it looks American, but it's, it's, there's breaking points. But if we, we make this model, and, and that's, I think, the challenge right now, we make, put this to the next layer, make this a little more abstract, maybe it fits better and we can export it better, which, you know, that's what, what America was really successful as exporting ideas. Yeah, I, I, that, that's an excellent point. It, it gets to the heart of, of what makes how I teach entrepreneurship different and why I've chosen to teach at private universities. Because at a public university, I can't, I can't challenge my students to integrate their values and their faith into how they act as an entrepreneur. Uh, yeah. And I think that's fundamentally important. I, 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 I truly believe that. And, and I don't care what those values and beliefs are. doesn't matter to me. We all have them. And as you say, there's a commonality uh, that, that we have across uh, lots of different belief systems, but there's a core there. And, and so with every entrepreneur I work with, I, one of the biggest challenges I, I give to them is to, is to really understand what your core values are and then show me how you're going to bring those to life in your business. Show me how you're going to act as a business person. How are you going to act towards your business partners? How are you going to act towards your investors, towards your customers, towards your employees based on those values? You can't have this disconnect. As you said, we've, we've kind of relegated, um, that sphere of our life to Sunday mornings, if even that, and 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 have failed to understand that that, that it, it it's it's designed to be something that 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 guides how we interact with integrity and in everything that we do. Yeah, I, it's I, a philosophy. I, 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 absolutely, don't, don't see it that way enough, and they don't see the value it, of it. It has to be. I mean, go, I, and that's why I have my students go back and read Adam Smith. And, and as silly as that sounds and as quaint as it sounds, that, I mean, he, he's the father of all of this. And, and, and at the very beginning, he said, it won't work if we don't tie this to values. This won't work if we don't tie this to a moral framework. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody should read Thomas Hobbes, John yes, Locke, Adam yes. Smith, everyone who is American. Yes. I mean, they're so fundamental to yes. that country. And we, we kind of associated with the founding fathers, but you know they were reciting John Locke twenty four seven because that was their idea of a revolutionary state. That's right. And it's something that's completely forgotten. I mean, I, I I'm an immigrant too. When I did my citizenship test, these things never came up. 
things like silly stuff came up, but the, but why didn't didn't I get handed a copy of these books? You know, it's literally free. Uh, you I, you can download them online. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, yeah, and we used to learn that. We used to learn that in school. Um, it's it's interesting. My I see in especially the students I work with a very legalistic framework, and, and I think that's a, a that, I think that's a reflection of how we kind of view this. We've we have we have delegated right and wrong to government and and we sort of removed it from our own souls and our own interactions in daily life and and so i'll just wait for the government to tell me what's right and wrong and, and i'll be safe well ethics doesn't work that way ethics yeah. ethics is murky and it and it, and it, it ties to, to core values um so yeah, this white question and it's, is it's been a big yeah. it's been a big part of 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 my own personal journey as an entrepreneur and and I challenge the entrepreneurs I work with to make it part of theirs. I keep asking you know why this why do why question has disappeared so much? I think that's that's just yeah. another way of expressing yeah. what you just said. Yeah. And I I've been asking a bunch of venture capitalists and they kind of stare at me um kind of kind of hollow when I ask them is there something in common you basically invest all your money in Israel, Silicon Valley and China. Is there something that is it a complete coincidence? Is it just that's what we do right now, or is there something that drives innovation, that drives entrepreneurship, that drives technology? This is the easiest way to to be an entrepreneur right now. It's harder to be as a philosopher to start a, a new venture. It's possible, but it's harder. <laughs> um, it, I saw uh, Stephen Kortick, and he he kind of took religion as a it makes it makes it a business. He he has succeeded in that. Yeah. In a strange way, but it's entertaining, right? <laughs> <laughs> it finds its audience for sure. Right. Um, but is there something right. in common? Do you feel if we start asking this why question, we find patterns and maybe they create better places that all these strangely very innovative and now, you know, in their third generation, very innovative places seem to have? Or is it all random? Um. Why don't they look like Papua New Guinea? That's that's kind of the question, right? So why is it not hunters and gatherers? So, so uh, the the answer I give is is not going to be complete, but there's a there's a growing body of research that tries to ask some of those questions, and and let's take it to to even a, a little more less extreme situation, and so let's look at why. Poland was so successful and why Hungary right next door struggled coming out of the Soviet uh, Empire the last 30 years or what time frame yes po po yeah. post post uh, Soviet era yes okay. over the last 30 years 40 years and 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 there's a growing body of research that suggests that a, a lot of that has to do with um, the political and social infrastructure in those countries. And, and so I, I think capital and, and investment is drawn to places where they can make money. And, and they can make money where there are markets that let them do what they need to do for the marketplace and let markets speak. And, and Israel understands that. And the U.S. has always understood that. And, and, and in a really strange way, China figure that out. Now with China, it, it's, it's, a, it's a strange animal because you have, you have complete control at, 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 at this upper level, but they've, they've let markets just run free uh, at, at, at sort of the grassroots level. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, and so it, it'll be interesting to see how sustainable that model is. We don't know. It's fairly new at this point. But even going back to Poland and and and, and uh, Hungary, when we've looked at countries right next to each other, same kind of history, um, Hungary um, kept a lot of of its central planning, a lot of its control systems in place, whereas in Poland, they really celebrated freedom, and they really celebrated let's get these markets wide open. Um, I used to love to take my, my entrepreneurship students to Eastern Europe and, and do extended study abroads over there so they could talk to entrepreneurs over there and, and, and learn about 
things and 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 the, and the students would would come back saying you know in many ways they viewed um, a lot of Eastern Europe going the opposite direction of the U.S. The U.S. was was starting to put controls back in place, was starting to regulate more, was starting to to do targeted taxes. You know, there, there's there, there's there's always two debates when you deal with taxes. There's the amount of tax, and there's also the method of tax. And 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 they're 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 both important, but they're separate issues. And and what we've we've shifted to in our country. Is a real focus on tax as a as a social tool, as 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 a political tool, and and it's not just a means of raising money for certain kinds of programs. Um, and, and and when my students get overexposed and, and get exposed to these kinds of things, they go, "Wow, I, I see this difference now." Yeah, they have a higher tax rate, but it's just a it's just a big tax. It's not used to try and encourage certain industries and not others and. And, and pick winners and pick losers and so forth. Uh, at least not in Poland, they didn't. Uh, whereas in, in, in some of the other economies, they, they, there was a hangover from the, the, from the Soviet plant economy. We saw that in place. Um, you know, I want to get back to, because to me, it, it kind of it dovetails off of this. You, you asked kind of two questions in one, and, and the one we haven't gotten to yet is, is there an entrepreneurial gene? Your memory is better than mine. Way better. And, uh, that's, that's a scary, that's a scary thing. Um, I'm, I'm the absent-minded professor who's about to retire. So, um, uh, you're, you're going to have a rough, uh, year, years ahead of you if you're already worse than me. So. Yes. That's um, what my girlfriend says. Yes. <laughs> she um, helps me too. No, I'm good. Okay. We, 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 we always need, uh, yes, yes. It's always good to have a better person than you by your side. Uh, that's what's gotten me through the last 43 sure. years. Um, but anyway, is there, is there an entrepreneurial gene? Um, I, I, I tend to, I tend to be on the side. I'm not a zealot about this, but I tend to be on the side that says not exactly. I think there's a, I think there's an entrepreneurial personality type. And I think that we have discovered it comes from a variety of different sources. There was a group of three, um, actually adjunct professors at Harvard. And, and I'm blanking on their names right now, but, but it was really interesting because to me, they did one of the best studies that's come out of Harvard in the last 20 years. And, and they're all adjuncts. They're not career academics. And, and they wanted to, to, to try and understand what leads to entrepreneurial success. And, and they, they, their premise was they weren't convinced that it was just this gene that, you know, it's, it's the person they're born that way and that's it. And, and what they found was absolutely fascinating. They found that, um, that how people are raised and the experiences that they're given and what they learn about along the way has a huge impact on, on their ability to be a successful entrepreneur. So if they, if they've been like, I was exposed to it, I was exposed by my dad at, at a very young age, I've exposed my kids to it. And so they live in that world now. My, my daughter, her, her, uh, her husband, uh, I have two very successful businesses. My son works in a, in a very successful uh, healthcare tech company. They're comfortable in that environment. And so that was one of the things. And so I think if you look at, at um, it, you know, for example, if you look at Israel and the U.S., we, we've had a lot of that. Uh, in, in those cultures. Um, they also, uh, one of the other biggest determinants um, um, was education and, and, and the exposure to knowledge and understanding about, about what is the right thing to do at certain times and what's the wrong thing. Um, you know, I, I tell my students, if, if I had been able to study entrepreneurship when I was in college, uh, I would have been so wealthy by now, I, you know, I would not be teaching them. I would have been retired 20 years ago. Um, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. And, and, and so people who are exposed to that tend to do better. And then the other thing is just luck. Um, it, it's just luck. Luck, luck, and we've, I've said that several times during our conversation today. 
people don't understand how important luck is in this. I, I have seen some incredibly hardworking entrepreneurs who I thought had amazing ideas and, and for whatever reason, they just don't have success. And I don't think it's for lack of trying. I don't think it's for lack of having a, a, a decent business model. It just didn't work out. And I've seen people who are complete idiots who did no prep, but stumble into something, become wildly successful. And, and you know, and it's luck in that situation. And so luck yeah. plays a big part in that. So all of that, though, requires a certain amount of freedom to act. And, and so I am I am absolutely convinced that the more freedom you have to act, the more entrepreneurship you're going to have. And so the time that I have spent, you know, as, as the EU has gotten stronger, I think a lot of their policies have been anti-entrepreneurial because they're, they're, they, they tend to want to pick industries. They want to pick winners. They want to have processes that make it very difficult to be an entrepreneur. And, and, and the more regulation, uh, the more steps you require, the more barriers you put in place, you're going to diminish the amount of entrepreneurship going on. And so if you look at Israel, Israel has been scrappy and they've been allowing people to come over there and do all this crazy research and they'll help them and they don't steer it and guide it. They just kind of give them a big playpen. The U.S. has been a big playpen and, and China, just because of their, their population, has this playpen that they've kind of let turn loose. Um, we for me, it's for me. We, it's when we, we saw we saw a really great yeah. experiment for a while. New Zealand, you know, I, I don't want to just focus on bigger countries. New Zealand had this really huge entrepreneurial burst about twenty years ago. It is because they deregulated everything, particularly agriculture, and they got all this innovation and all these things going on. And then they had a recession, which we have, and then they went back to their old ways. And now they're highly regulated and highly taxed again. I don't think we can diminish the role of government policy on this. Now, that being said, I, I do think there are certain people who have a personality type that, that uh, makes them comfortable within the realm of entrepreneurship. I don't, think there's an entrep I don't think there's a personality type. I don't think there's a gene. But I think certain people are drawn to that. And, and I think certain people are comfortable with that. I think your ability to, to deal with uncertainty and risk are at the heart of that. Uh, those are those are things you can learn. You can learn on, on how to deal with uncertainty by being exposed to uncertainty, by having to deal with uncertainty. You can you can learn to deal with risk by learning about risk and how to mitigate risk and how to manage risk. And so, um, uh, I, I think I, I think there is a certain amount of this that is uh, that, that that certain people are drawn to entrepreneurship and have a personality type um, that's drawn to that. Uh, but I, I, I don't think they were born that way. I also don't think it's very easy for me to teach them that. I, that's not something I can teach them in college because a lot of that was formed when they were little. And, and so I can only deal with the ones who are drawn to entrepreneurship and, and give them the education to, to give them a better chance of success. I, that, that's it. I, I don't make entrepreneurs. Uh, my has never been my job. My job as an educator is to give that would be amazing, right? So if, yeah. if you find a way to make entrepreneurs, that's kind of, I think, what the societal experiment is going to be about the next twenty years. Because if if we only believe half of what all the AI cracks are saying, is that we never have to do anything repetitive ever again. Everything will be done by machines, including problem solving. Most problem solving will be so cheap that you don't, you you, you can't bother with it. It's like it's cheaper than buying coffee. And we will reach that state relatively quickly. So we will have plenty of time on our hands. We will have kind of similar problem that we had so far because we had a lot of new tools, maybe not as much adoption as tools, but we had a lot of new tools for information gathering and they've definitely helped. There's no doubt about it. But productivity has gone the other way, which is really a paradox. It should have moved our, par our productivity up, but that hasn't happened. We haven't really... We haven't really figured out anything we can do with it, right? So maybe there is something out there. We can finally heal cancer. These things are coming online. But the last 20 years, it went the opposite ways. More technology, more information, but productivity tanked. Do you well, think that's... It, 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 it yeah. depends how you measure productivity, too. And, true, true. And, and, and well, let's stick to the old measurement and for, for now. You, you're absolutely right. There's maybe different definitions about that. But for now, let's keep this... 
Do you think we're going to reverse this the next 20 years? And for that, we can make more entrepreneurs through education and through an, an, a way that the culture values yes. and the development oh, I, culture oh, I values abs risk taking? Absolutely. I think we could. I absolutely, I know we could. Uh, yeah. I, we we could form them, but it's not going to be when they come to the university. It, it's it's okay. going to be in grade school. It's going to be in, in even before that. Um, you know, you talk YouTube, about maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you talk about technology. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, this is how I used to do math. You know, with a slide rule, because uh, I I learned math before there were calculators. Uh, I remember the first the, the calculators first came out when I was in high school and. We weren't allowed to use them because that's, my goodness, you're not going to learn math if you use a calculator. So we use slide rules and, and did it by hand. Um, we don't even think about that anymore. And, and so I think one of the things we have to be careful about is when we start thinking about AI and all these other innovations is, is to not create this static frozen model in our mind about what that's going to create. Because the fact that I don't have to do this and and I now have a, a I now have a cell phone that has more computing power than the mainframe computer I learned to program on when I was in high school. Um, that's freed me up to think about higher things and 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 do more things. And that that's a different measure of productivity. We can have a static measure measure of productivity that has declined, but there's also a dynamic measure of productivity, and that has grown. And I think it expand more if we just unfetter people and let them pursue these things instead of, of uh, and getting back to your point earlier, um, protecting dead industries, zombie companies uh, is just, it, it's insane. It's insane that we do that because yeah. we're, we're, we're going to end up, we're going to end up with a very sad state uh, in, in this, in this, in this country. If, if we do that, we're going to, we're going to look a lot like the Soviet Union did toward the end of its days when all the factories were, were wore out and the people were unhappy and, and because there was no innovation. You know, yeah. I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to do it by hand anymore. I don't have to be bothered with that. My mind is free to, to innovate, and that's productivity as well. I think, Jeff, you're putting the finger to the wound there. What, what happens to... And it never happened in the Soviet Union. I was part of that. I lived in Eastern Germany when I was really young. It, you, humans always come up with something they can use their time more productively. And yes, we measure it in dollars. That's imperfect. And you know, philosophy is not measured in dollars. And that's a lot of people are rediscovering philosophy because they have the time. They didn't have that. But over time, and you can focus this through the millennia, when we increase our productivity, we can create something more valuable in a shorter amount of time. This this always holds true. Yes, there is lags, and it, it doesn't. It's not not a very smooth process, but we usually always come up with something of higher value that we really want, right? So nobody wanted an iPhone twenty years ago because it wasn't it didn't exist. Now my my children all they want is an iPhone. That's what they're fascinated with. So right. we change our perceptions of what we want, and that drives our productivity up. We say, oh, I can't do this anymore. I can't walk in the fields. I can't clean houses anymore. No, I now. I don't know, I become a door dasher. What, whatever releases this new productivity, but it's driven by our desire for something new that I didn't even know I wanted. I didn't know I wanted Tesla 10 years ago. No, I want one. Right. So that drives us, that, that, that sucks the whole society to higher productivity. Now, of course, the measurement is not ideal, but we definitely see this graph. And we, we as entrepreneurs, we basically, we, we are a big poor part of this because A, we figure out what's possible and what's not just theoretically possible. And B, we also make it happen in a crappy version, first version, and it looks terrible. But we, 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 we create this desire for something new and then people buy into it. And then, oh, then they realize, oh, man, I don't have enough money left. Now I need to make more money. So that distributes through the whole economy. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and what, what scares me to death is, is, is when, we, when we break that process. And so... For example, uh, my my grandmother um, washed clothes by hand because that was the technology. And then, uh, you know, my 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 dad after World War II went to work for this scrappy little appliance manufacturing company that was had had built these new technologies for automating clothes washing and drying. And and. And had we had we kind of locked in and said, "Oh no, no, we 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 have to protect this industry," 
because there's so many jobs at stake here and, and you know, they, they give a lot of money to us and so we got to protect them. We never would have had the next innovation and the next innovation and the next innovation. We break, we break that process, uh, you know, that, that Schumpeter made famous uh, of, of creative destruction by, by trying to, to uh, pick the winners and pick the losers and protect what was passed. What was passed was passed. Nobody makes slide rules in any large amount anymore. That's okay. There's lots of other things that we can make. We just had to get comfortable with the fact that nothing is permanent. That's, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. That's the beauty of free markets is, is, is nothing is static and everything is dynamic. The problem is that as, as people amass money and power, they, they try to protect the status quo and, and they try to break that cycle. I mean, that we see it time and time and time again. We're seeing it in, in the financial industry right now. The banks are desperately trying to stay relevant. They're not. They're not. FinTech, yeah. FinTech if, 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 if left free, FinTech would have made banking obsolete 10 years ago. The trading desk probably will still make money. So like Goldman Sachs has an edge, but everyone else is basically dead in the water. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. They're all going to go PC. They're going to go woke. That's what happened to journalism. Yeah. That's what happened to the, yeah. it's happening to yeah. universities. Oh. It's going by industry because like the last straw of saying, okay, I need government money. It's all, I'm the victim. And then five years later, they all go on these jobs anyway. So these right. usually, these things don't really last very long. It's, it's worth a shot. I would do it as well. Like I, I you know, what, if I have a business that can get a billion dollars from the government in exchange for nothing, well, I would apply for it. Why not? Right. Right. Especially right. Well, other I, people I don't, do it. I don't fault you as the entrepreneur for doing that. I fault the culture and the society for letting those things happen. Yeah. When you look back into, and we just talked about things that are really fragile, what would and how was entrepreneurship over the millennia? Like if we go 2,000 years back or 3,000 years back, I don't know if you ever looked into history. I thought you were going to ask me if I remembered the back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that's what my children would say now that you don't, you, you never used a calculator. Um, I'm kidding. What, what was different and what was the same? And what, was it very different? Well, I think what was the same is, is we've always had this tendency to people to want to amass power and money. And, and I don't think I, I, that's been an age old problem. It's been an age old struggle. It's, that's what's led to revolutions. That's what's led to uh, disruptions. Uh, and, and so I think the cycles have really just repeated themselves. You know, we, 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 we have people who want to create change and, and use change to, to make more change. And, and, and we have people who have amassed power and, and money who have a vested interest in keeping that from happening. So I, I think that that cycle. Is, is you know, we, we, we have always been innovative. Um, and, and it's always been, it's always been the existing power structure that has squelched that innovation and that entrepreneurship and that new way of thinking. Uh, uh, that's what scares me so much about the fact that we have purged critical thinking from universities. Uh, because it, it, it's that critical thought that gets me asking questions that no one's asked that leads to those aha moments to go, oh my God, you know, no one's ever thought about solving this problem this way. There's, I can come up with this new product. That's critical thinking, and and we've purged that from the universities, and it, it it scares me to death. Well, I mean, universities make themselves superfluous with this, right? So if you, as further you you walk away from the reality because of politics, you know that's what happened with with socialism. They walked away intentionally from reality because they wanted utopia to be truth, and to an extent, it worked, right? You, they they realized that they can motivate people with this utopia, and it, it's great to motivate people. But if the returns don't come in, it carries a tax. And Correct. if you carry a higher tax than your neighbor, you're, you're toast. The compound interest, you know, after 20 years in the early 70s, everyone knew this thing was over. It took a while to play out. And I think this is true for the universities. If they don't change, if they, they carry a positive tax to someone who can tell the truth for less price or the same price, they're toast. And so that's where private universities come in or online universities. I think it's, a, it's, it's, 
it's a death cycle, death struggle there anyway. It, right now. It, I, I think I think there's some truth in that. I think there's always going to be a place. Um, uh, you know, my my vision of higher education is is uh, is that I think we're gonna I think we're gonna end up looking a lot more like we did in the '60s than we did in the last ten or twenty years, and that is that that higher education is a is a one nichey little path that people can have to go into adulthood and 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 careers but it's only one yeah. we've we've made it this universal thing which is crazy in my in my mind yeah. um it, it's interesting some of the roots of that goes back in at least in the u.s some of the roots of that goes back to the vietnam war and everybody wanted to go to college in the 1960s because if you were in college you got a deferment from the draft and you have to go to vietnam and so that's when we had this this rapid expansion of university education in the U.S. and and this notion that everybody should go to college and it kind of stuck. You know, one of the things that's that to me is fascinating is is we have these unintended consequences culturally when when something happens because of this, but now it becomes permanent even though this doesn't exist anymore. We don't, you know, we're not fighting in Vietnam anymore, but everybody is still convinced that higher education is the only path to the future. And it's not, it's, it's the right path for some professions. I think it plays a vital role in, in culture and society if it's done correctly. Um, but it's not the right path for everybody. And, and we're starting to see that we're seeing a lot of technology companies that are saying, you know what, we're just going to get really smart kids out of high school and we're going to kind of, you know, we'll, we'll kind of help grow up a little bit and, and, and channel that, that really smart mind they have for mathematics and programming and and we'll we'll do it ourselves we don't need you to do that and there's even been some rumblings in the accounting industry that they may want to start to do some modified version of that because they're finding that you know even requiring basically five years of higher education to be, become a cpa they're still having to retrain and teach them like they didn't know much and so they're saying well why don't we just do more of that and, and, and you know, go further upstream with these kids and, and deal with them sooner? So I think you're going to start to see that. So you're going to see fragmentation of, of education. And, and as long as we let that happen, I think it's going to be great. And there'll, there'll, be, there'll, there'll always be a place for a place like Belmont. Is, you know, the, these kinds of institutions where I teach today have been around for, for a long, long time. And, and they play a, an important role, but they're not the only role. I'm glad you say this is really, really honest as an educator, how this image is shifting. And uh, as, you, as you say, I fully agree, this is, this is a good thing, right? More choice makes everyone happier. I think that's, that's a lesson we definitely should have learned, or maybe some of us are learning it right, only right now. When you look at other countries, and we kind of touched on this earlier, where do you see entrepreneurship is strong, is bubbling up? It's maybe for government policy, maybe just by accident. Um, and I learned this from Eric Wiener when he talked about the geography of geniuses. Some of them are entrepreneurs, some of them are not, but they seem to bubble up in random places, very unpredictable. It seems to be a complex system, so it's not linear. You can't easily forecast this. There's a bunch of variables and you still don't know what effect does one variable have on the others. But when you look around the world, we have 190 countries. Where do you feel they, either by accident or by good government policy, they know what they're doing? Uh, um, I, so we can go I, by I, continent, like Singapore, yeah, a lot I, of people are very bullish on Singapore still. Uh, yeah, Hong I'm, Kong, I, I, not I'm so much somewhat maybe. bullish on Singapore, uh, but there, there, there are certain cultural aspects that give me pause. Um, you know, I, I still, I still see a lot of amazing things happening in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and, and I think what they've done right there is, is they've just gotten out of the way. They've just gotten out of the way. And, and so, you know, I've, it, it's my, my long pause on that question was it, it's, I, I don't know what the world's going to be like post COVID because we've had this, uh, we, we have had this, uh, <laughs> A massing of a lot of power uh, uh, in governments uh, because of, of of COVID, or ostensibly because of COVID, 
which is a real disease. I had it and I was sick and I, you know, I, I'm not a non-believer in COVID, but I also. It's funny how we, we have to add this disclaimer, right? Well, we do because there's a lot of nuts out there who don't think it's real, but, <laughs> yeah. but it is real. It's true. Yeah. But I, but I will tell you that it's being exploited and it's yeah. being exploited by a lot of, of governments, sometimes intentionally and sometimes just because the kind of people who get drawn into government love power anyway. And so, yeah. um, I, you know, my hesitancy when you ask that question is I, I haven't had the, the opportunity to spend as much time traveling the world and even communicating around the world as I did pre COVID. And, and if you had asked me that question pre COVID, I would have said, Ireland is really an exciting place for me right now. Uh, I would have said Eastern Europe is really an exciting place. I would say Singapore is an exciting place. I would say Vietnam is, you know, is one of those weird kind of things where it's, yes, it's got a communist hat on, but it's got these amazing free markets going on at the ground level. And, and so there's, there, there were all kinds of really interesting spots. When you ask me that today and into tomorrow, I don't know that we, we you know, we're, there's there's a big uh, there, there's a big question mark in my head when you ask a question like that because I don't know what things look like anymore because I'm not there and I don't have the opportunity to interact as much as I used to. Yeah, yeah. Well, this and right? So and, it, and, yeah, and, the location also, has less of an effect. Maybe uh, we said that about the internet. It didn't work out. Yeah, that well. no, and. And, and, and the wild card is just this, this, this power grab that's gone on that yeah. they're not going to let go. They're not going to let go. And, and some and, will let go, I feel. Some won't. Eventually. They will be the, eventually, the ones who yeah, restore some freedom. Yes. Uh, eventually they will. And they'll be the winners. You're absolutely right. Totally agree. Totally I see agree. this in Germany a lot. I don't know if, how, what you think of Germany. So Germany is this old Western Euro power full with regulation and kind of took this crazy regulation via the European Union to all the other countries and they're still smoldering and they kind of, it's this German imperialism that they drove, right? So they, they, they took companies that the Germans are very good at bureaucracy. They know they're very efficient bureaucracy. They have a lot of bureaucracy, but it's very efficient. So they, yes. they use that same model, put it all over the European Union, extracted all the profits, and now they, they're kind of, we don't really know what we, need to, what we need to do. We don't want to support Greece forever. We don't want to support Italy forever because that's what's going to happen more or less because it's very difficult for Italian companies to compete for their own problems, uh, certainly, but they just don't run on the German model. What I felt is Germany is in this spot from what I hear where they kind of took a lot of mixed messages, especially from America or around the world that went all the way, what happens with COVID, how much regulation should we need, how, how panicked should we be. And we, you know, America was on both sides. We had people who said, shut everything down forever. And we had other people who said, let's completely ignore this. This thing will blow over. And Germany seems to have, you know, taken it too seriously. They didn't have this debate. They didn't have the extremes and then came together in the middle like we usually do in the US. They kind of, they, they always go into one extreme and uh, the, they're very efficient with going into extremes as well. They are right. efficient with a lot of things. Right. And I wonder if as a, they've been very successful despite all the problems that you, the sick men of Europe as it was in the 90s, right? They've been very successful the last 20 years. I wonder if, if, when you look at France and Germany, if they will continue to have a good run, they will be in trouble because they, they have low debt, debt numbers. Um, they, they macroeconomically, they look much better than they are, I feel. Right, right. Yeah, I, I don't know. And, 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 and I, don't, I don't think we know the ripple effects. I mean, the, the EU has been a, a double-edged sword for, for Germany because it, it has certainly uh, given them uh, the ability to... Um, uh, expand economic power, but they've also absorbed a lot of economic dependency as they've expanded. And, and yeah. so I don't, again, I don't know. I, I, I think there has, there is so much, it, 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 going back to when I, when I was talking about the move from the mainframe computers to distributed computing, no one could predict that, that Apple and, and, and Microsoft are going to be the winners. Nobody did. Nobody predicted that. In fact, most of us thought Apple was the craziest business model we ever heard of. Their whole business model was putting these things for free in schools. And we're saying, how do you make money doing that? Um, and, and Microsoft, their whole business model was, you know, uh, basically, you know, 
suckling on the on, on the hind teeth of 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 IBM and and riding that as as far as I could. So uh, most people thought those those were crazy business models that were good, that were not going to succeed. And, and and I think we're we're entering a period of even greater disruption right now because of not just really not COVID as much as as the world reaction to COVID, and 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 the power grab that people are 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 are, are using COVID for, and so I, I'm I'm very hesitant to predict the future. Uh, I, you know, my my career as an entrepreneur has never been. I've never viewed myself in my entrepreneurial life as as a visionary. Uh, I'm an opportunist, and and I think a lot of career entrepreneurs uh, would describe themselves if they were honest that way. Um, and so, it, you know, uh, I'm I'm fascinated by the the changes that are going to happen. They create opportunity, and I look forward to uh, seeing what those are, and, and seeing which ones are interesting, and 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 see which ones I might play a part in somehow. Uh, but um, my crystal ball, as I, the older I've gotten, the more I realize how how lousy my crystal ball is. Because uh, back when we went to distributed computing, I was convinced that the Wang machine, W A N G, was going to be the winner. And, and, and that was this machine that was all it did was word processing because we were convinced that distributed computing was going to be lots of specialized machines. And we thought, well, Wang is going to be great because word processing is, is one of the biggest inefficiencies in the office space. You know, that company came and went within a couple of years. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I've stopped making that kind of grand prediction and I'm, I'm much more interesting in interested in, in understanding emerging trends. And, and we don't know yet what those emerging trends are going to be. We'll have to wait yes. and see. Yeah, it is hard to make these predictions. It's just too many variables. And today, even if you make a prediction, put it out on Wall Street Bats on Reddit, you change reality, right? Just because you made that prediction, well, you true. change reality. That's so it's, yeah. it's, you have to think about that too, that based on what you do and if it goes viral, maybe the opposite becomes true. I think we, we already see this. We saw this with COVID and the stock market. We thought it's going to go down, and it did. But then, like two months later, it, since then, it, it an enormous bull run, which everyone who who watches the real economy couldn't believe it. But if you watch the digital economy, you know why it went up so much because it, all this money went somewhere, and that's impossible to predict, right? And it's impossible to to, yep. to foresee how how consumers will and, change their mind. And 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 therein lies luck. And this, you know, which, which, is, which has been a, a recurring theme throughout all of this conversation, you know, yeah. and, and I and I try to prepare my students for that. I, I try to tell them, listen, you're going to have some periods of good luck and bad luck. It's just part of it, you know. It's sort of, you know, I, I, I'm I'm an avid golfer, and and I, I love to use golf metaphors. I said I can hit the best shot in the world, but if it lands in a weird spot on the turf, I could get a horrible bounce, even though I hit the, the shot perfectly. And, and and the same thing happens as an entrepreneur. You can execute perfectly, but there's there's these variables you can't control, and and those are the ones that are gonna that are gonna affect your score. That those are the ones that are gonna make the difference between you know getting Absolutely. a par or birdie or a double bogey. I have to give it to Nassim Taleb one more time with the fooled by randomness. I always love that expression. Yep, we said exactly taking things right. that are random yep. is actually something that we have control over. Anyways, Jeff, this was awesome. Thank you very much for this conversation. I learned. I, so I appreciate the invitation. I'm, I was honored. Insights. I was honored to be asked, and, and it was a lot of fun to chat, as always. Same here. Same here. I hope we get to do this again. Would love to. Sounds great, Jeff. Thanks for doing this. Take it yep. easy. All right. Talk soon. Bye.